Welcome to the Real Estate Syndication Show. Whether you are a seasoned investor or building a new real estate business, this is the show for you. Whitney Sewell talks to top experts in the business. Our goal is to help you master real estate syndication. And now your host, Whitney Sewell. Are you a new or sophisticated investor wanting to learn how to operate a successful syndication business? For life-changing training from the nation's leading syndication expert, my friend Vinny Chopra has the training you need. Text LEARN, L-E-A-R-N, to 474747. This is your daily real estate syndication show. I'm your host, Whitney Sewell. Today, our guest is Matthew Pollard. Thanks for being on the show, Matthew. Mate, welcome. I'm very happy to be here. Thanks for having me on. No, it's an honor to have you on. And uh, Matthew is responsible for five multi-million dollar business success stories in his home country of Australia, all before the age of 30. And that's impressive. He's a best-selling author uh, whose book, The Introvert's Edge, has received endorsements from Harvard, Princeton, Nail Patel, and Marshall Goldsmith, just to name a few. Been featured by Fox, NBC, Fortune, Forbes, uh, Incorporated, Entrepreneur, and CEO. Also the founder of Small Business Festival, which uh, Incorporated has named a top three national conference for small businesses. Wow, Matthew, thank you so much for your time. I know your expertise is going to be very valuable to the listeners in, in this industry, uh, but tell us a little more about who you are in case they haven't heard of you, and then let's dive in. Yeah, sure. I mean, you, I mean a lot of what you covered in the bio, I think one of the, the most interesting things uh, is most people hear that bio and go, oh, no, this guy sounds like he just, you know, started w with it being easy and, and, and kind of continued down that path, right? I mean, five multi-million dollar success stories before you turn 30 kind of sounds like I must have started with some, you know, some, some, a really good formula right up front. And, you know, that's because a lot of people see me as I am now. They don't see me as, as I was, you know, I've got a, a slide that I put up during a lot of my stage presentations where I put a photo up at my sister's wedding that just highlights this really acne ridden face that, you know, that, that I, that I had. But on top of that, I actually had this condition called Erlen syndrome. And I was lucky to get diagnosed with that because I was, it was misdiagnosed as dyslexia for all that time. And people just thought I was lazy. And luckily enough, at the age of 16, I put on this pair of glasses and magically I can, I can start the process of learning to read, but not like everybody, you know, I couldn't read like everyone else. I had to start the process. So I had a reading speed of a sixth grader in late high school. And, you know, I really pushed and pushed and pushed to, to, to do anything through high school. And I, I managed to get to the point where I got into the top 20% of my state, but it took every bit of energy I had. And I have to tell you, I mean, I, I was exhausted and my family could see it. So while a lot of people go straight off to university, I did what a lot of Australian kids get away with is I got to say, I want to have a gap year, take a year off to, to really find myself. And my family agreed because they knew that I wouldn't be able to, you know, just go into any degree and just prosper. I really needed to be motivated. So they let me take the year off, but not to sit on the, t the couch and watch Oprah like a lot of people did. But I, I had to, you know, my family wasn't rich. I really had to learn, you know, how to, I had to get a job and I had to, you know, earn my keep, as my father put it. And so I took a job at a real estate agency. And I know what you're thinking out the front selling real estate. And maybe that's why that people would think maybe that's why he's on the show. But I actually, I lost my job only a few weeks in. The company shut down just before Christmas. And, you know, they decide, you know, it, Australia's very different. Like in America, you know, you have Thanksgiving, you have Christmas. And then, I mean, it's cold, right? So everyone goes back to work. In Australia, it's our summer and our Christmas break at the same time. We go on holidays on the 20th of December. We don't come back till the 15th or 20th of January. So I couldn't get a job anywhere. I mean, nobody was hiring. I mean, Anybody that's in business, think about it. Are you hiring just before taking a month off? No way. So the only jobs I could get were these things called commission-only sales roles. And I mean, for an introverted kid with a reading speed of a sixth grader who struggled to talk to his own friends, you can imagine that would have been terrifying. And for me, I, I mean, I went to the training. I, I went for the interviews. And luckily enough, I was wearing a suit. And because of that, I had potential, right? Because I was the only guy that came to the interview wearing a suit, even though it was this black shine in the sun kind of suit with a green shirt and a post office red tie, I had potential because I at least came well dressed and nobody else that's going for interviews at that time really seems to care. So I got put in the business team and after five days of product training and not a single second of sales training, I got thrown on this road selling telecommunications. It was called Sydney Road, which is, we're talking a thousand doors on each side, which is great. If you're going to get told no, why not not have far to walk, right? 
But I got to, like, I went to go into the first door and I had this realization, like no one told me how to sell. I mean, I didn't even know what to say. So I took a deep breath. I walked into the first, first door. I got told no. Then after that, I got less politely told no. Then I got sworn at. Then I got my personal favorite, go and get a real job. And door after door, that just kept happening and kept happening until the 93rd door where I made my first sale. I remember I made like $70. I was ecstatic for about 45 seconds. And then I had the second realization of the day. I got to do this tomorrow and the next day and the next and the next. And it just wasn't okay. So I had to make a decision. I think a lot of people that are selling real estate syndication, you know, you know, introverted or extroverted or not, a lot of times when we get presented with a barrier, a lot of times we say to ourselves, well, this is insurmountable. You know, it's just not a natural ability. Now we've all heard of this concept gift of gap, right? Introverts don't have it. Extroverts obviously do. Well, if I had to believe that my year was going to suck. So I had to find another way. So I, I came to, to this belief that sales had to be a system, a systematic process like anything else. And if I just adhered to that system, then I would be able to succeed. So I went looking for a way to do that. And what I found was this thing that you know, everyone knows of it these days. I, I just, you know, but I couldn't pick up a Brian Tracy or a Zig Ziglar book. I had a reading speed of a sixth grader, but luckily YouTube was then available. It's well before podcasts. And there's a lot more on YouTube than just cat videos. There were people talking about the sales systems and the different tactics. And every day I went out and I applied those strategies and I got better and better at a single one and focused on the overall system. It was eight hours worth of selling, eight hours worth of practice. Weekends were great more practice. It was a terrible six weeks. But soon it became 93 doors to 78 to 45 to 31 to 26 to 18 to 9 to 3. I mean, six weeks in, my boss pulls me in and he's like, Matt, we're a little bit blown away by this. I thought I was in trouble. He's like, we just got the national sales report. You're actually the number one salesperson in the company, which just happened to be the largest sales and marketing company in the Southern Hemisphere. It took six weeks, which is why when people are like, oh, I'm not sure if I can sell real estate, you know, I'm really passionate about making money out of investment, or I'm really passionate about the business of it, but I don't know if I could ever sell it to someone. If it took me six weeks to sell something, to go from having no business, to being terrified in sales, to being the number one person in the company, you know, you absolutely can. Now, there are a lot of things that you can do before that, to make the heavy lifting of sales easier, but you absolutely can do sales. And because, I mean, that's where I start. If I can do door to door sales with that face and that reading speed and that uncomfortability around sales, really anyone can do it. It's, it's amazing though, that you went 93 doors, like you went 93 doors getting rejected, but you still, you still got there. I mean, you still kept going. And I think most people would have quit long before that. Well, you know, I would, I'm not sure if that's luck or, unlu uh, or unlucky, really. I mean, <laughs> it was about 4.30 when I got that sale. So I'm not sure if I would have gone past five o'clock, I went, well, that's the day. And I, I wonder what would have happened if that had a change, right? But the truth is that I've always been one to, to really focus and say, storm the torpedoes, I've got to find a way. And life wasn't easy for me. I mean, I couldn't read. So school wasn't easy. This wasn't easy. This was uncomfortable and not easy. But I promised my father that I was going to earn my keep and this was the only way I could do it. So I think it was a lot to do with the fact that I'd made a commitment. I was worried about going home and saying I hadn't you know, lived up to that commitment. It was bad enough to say I'd lost my job at the real estate company. And I watched my dad break his back for 80 hours a week supporting the family up until then. There was no way I was okay. So you could almost say I willed that sale on the 93rd door because I was unrelenting on keeping to do it. And I think these days in our minds, a lot of the times, I mean, life's pretty easy for us these days. I mean, it's not like, you know, if we get sick, we're going to die. You know, we, it's not like if we have a bad day, we're not, we don't have a lovely four bedroom house we can come home to and a great meal that we can pick up for, you know, in an affordable way. I mean, today's generation, we have a lot to be thankful for, right? Our life really isn't that tough. But that means when something gets slightly tough, we're like, oh no, probably not for me. It's not my natural ability. I'm just, I'm just going to not do it. That's the wrong mindset to have. I mean, sales is a wonderful skill to have that you can use in job interviews. You can use to get promoted. You can use to convince your kids that they really should eat their greens, right? The, the, there is such, it's such a wonderful thing. Like you think about for the people here that know syndication well, I mean, there are a lot of people that are in lots of different industries that are struggling to make money in their investments. 
and they, you know, they might have, you know, high six figure jobs and they've got no idea how to retire because they just, they haven't found the right investment strategy. And it, it comes so simply to, to a lot of people watching this show to invest in them, to find them, to, to sell them. Yet for a lot of people, it's really difficult. There's no difference between that and sales. There's no difference between that and the, the things that you need or what I call the three steps to rapid growth to have a really successful business. The problem is what we tend to do is we become very good at our functional skill and everything that's outside that, we tend to wing it. You know, so when it comes to sales, a lot of times, and this isn't new stuff, Brian Tracy said that the top 10% of all sales performers, introvert or extrovert or not, had a planned presentation. The bottom 80% just say whatever comes out of their mouth. And as people in the syndication industry, a lot of the times, what we do is we tend to not only just say whatever comes out of our mouth, we tend to like to over-educate people because we feel they're making a big financial decision, so education is the key. And the, cust the, the customer or the person that we're trying to sell the idea to walks away going, this, you know, either this sounds scamish or, wow, I'm overwhelmed with lots of details. God, I'm just going to go and in in invest in something else because this is overly complex. And we did it to ourselves. We made something overly complex when they didn't really want to know that. Like one of the biggest elements around sales is storytelling, where you take this big complex thing and you tell a story instead of somebody that had that problem where you did an implementation, you got a, you got a different outcome. You know, the last syndication expert I worked with, you know, he had this really complex story about this guy that was, he was a doctor and he was trying to spend, uh, he, he, was, he, he wanted to get into retirement. He had no idea how to do it. He had a really expensive lifestyle and kids that were going to really expensive universities. And he had no idea how he was ever going to get out of earning that sort of money. So he went to a real estate uh, investment seminar. Next thing he knew, he was buying invest, rental properties. And the market went down. So he, he, not only was the, 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 he only making a little bit of money, the market went down. So now he's made a physical loss, yet there's maintenance issues. So now he's going and handling his own maintenance. He's a maintenance man, right? For, for, these, for these places, he's like, this is ridiculous. It's the wrong strategy. And it was for him, right? So by, the, by telling him that strategy, the implementation that was made, the syndication deal that he got involved in, and how it then allowed him, the, afforded him the opportunity, his position, his high salary afforded him the position to get into it. And now the change and the success who cares about all the technicalities? The customer doesn't care. They just want to know that you worked with someone just like them that had a similar problems that were thinking about the same things or already down that path. The, the fact that you worked with them and you got them a more effective outcome. And here's the other core things about stories, which is just one part of a sales process. People remember 22 times more information when embedded into a story. So all your jargon is more memorable inside the story. On top of that, it creates a natural, uh, you know, studies out of Princeton highlight that it activates the reticular activating system of our brain, which means our brains synchronize and that creates artificial rapport until we can turn it into real rapport. And then thirdly, it short circuits the logical mind and speaks directly to the emotional mind. Now, what part of the brain do you think is terrified about working at 95 years old because they can't get themselves out of their J-O-B that they created themselves? Of course, it's the emotional part of the brain. So if I was going to say all of it. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, we absolutely. But the emotional mind is the clear driver. Yeah. So when you're talking about sales as a process, most people don't use enough stories. And a lot of times it's funny. It's like they go, oh, yeah, I do use story. You're like, yeah, well, tell me one of the stories. Customer ordered this, so I gave it to them. Or some little touch points, but not this well emotionally driven story about this, you know, doctor that was struggling to get, you know, struggling with this rental property and dealing with maintenance issues. And his wife saying, you're already working crazy hours. Why have you now taken on another job? Right. You can really frame these amazing stories that you can use that speak to your ideal clients. And I, lo I love that. So, so, you know, it's awesome. You know, many, many things there that you pointed to is really understanding your client or, or understanding who this person is, what's important to them. So we're not speaking all this jargon that makes it seem too confusing, right? Or, or like, you know, you and I mentioned earlier, this, even the term syndication, you know, can sound like a scam if somebody's never heard of it while they, they may be very aware, aware that they can invest in real estate and even want to, but then you talk about numerous things like that and, and they're just confused and, the, and their answer is know. And so help us to, you know, help us to understand how to have that conversation, maybe even to build our own story or things we should be thinking about. And so we're coming across, you know, I mean, relating to them, but not pushing them away. Yeah, absolutely. So there, 
there are a couple of things there. So firstly, you're right. Syndication, for the people in the know, you've just commoditized yourself, right? Because you say, I do what everybody else does. So now they compete, you're competing on price, who's got the best deal. That's the worst place to be. The second thing is the people that don't understand it have probably watched a gangster movie back in the, back in the day and they're like, oh, gambling syndications. No, no, that sounds bad and scammy. Where's the win in that? Now, the major focus is that before we even get to sales, there are two things that we need to do. We need to understand the marketplace that we're selling to, right? For me, when I first started in business, I sold directly to, you know, I told taught rapid growth. I was the rapid growth guy for business coaches. Then I was the rapid growth guy for professional service providers, then service providers, then all of the introvert market. But I started by growing out. So many people get it wrong. They're like, I'll sell to anyone at the start. But when you've got less economies of scale, less testimonials, less success, you don't want to sell to more people because then you're in this highly competitive market where everyone's got more experience than you. You want to start small. And even then, when you're successful, why would you still not want to work with your absolute ideal clients? I mean, if your ideal client is a doctor or a, or, or a lawyer, or maybe just, and then later you move out to those highly professional groups, there's, there's millions of them. Why would you ever get bored just working within that demographic? But the next most important thing is we've all gone to networking events and we can say, oh, I'm in syndication and that sounds scary or for the people that know it commoditizes, or we say, oh, we're in, we're, we're in real estate. Oh, no, no, I'm already invested in properties. It sounds like a sales pitch. People are like, no, now you're a real estate salesperson and it feels uncomfortable. So we go to networking events all the time and a lot of people, what happens is people are trying to put us in this box. Now, one of the things, and you know what, while I've worked with people in syndication, I gotta be a little bit careful about not giving away you know, what we did for specific clients. So let me give you an example from outside the industry and then I'll, I'll help explain, I'll, I'll help weave it into to the specific industry. So the, what I would say, so I had a language coach out of California. You know, she taught kids and adults Mandarin, right? And she came to me, she had a pretty significant problem. I mean, when she went and, uh, and, and worked in the, in the industry 10 years ago, you know, she was, you know, she'd been charging, you know, 50 to $80 an hour successfully since then and had no issue getting clients. But now there are all these people moving into California that were willing to teach people for cheaper prices to get their first clients. And then on top of that, thanks to the global economy that we live in, you know, there were people in China willing to do it on Craigslist for $12 an hour. So now she's competing against 30 to $40 an hour locally and $12 an hour on Craigslist. Now, thanks to our friends in Silicon Valley as well, she's now got to compete against online free programs. I'll teach you Mandarin, you teach me English, we just won't charge anyone anything. So now she's competing against free. So she comes to me and she's like, Matt, how do I, how do I learn some sales tactics to close more deals? And I said, Wendy, there's no win in that, right? At best, you're going to get these clients for a short period of time until they, they then start working with someone else and, you've used, and you're using these tactics that are going to make you feel uncomfortable. I mean, sales done right should be a natural step-by-step -step process that leads to a sale. But if you're not helping the client or if you're not helping the client more in your specific way, how can you explain the price differentiation? So I said, what we need to do instead is we need to avoid the battle altogether. So I started to look at all the clients that she worked with. And I mean, she worked with hundreds over the years, but there were two people specifically that she helped with a lot more. And these were executives being relocated across to China. And she helped them with these three really cool concepts. So the first one was the concept of galaxy. Now, I know that sounds like outer space for us, but to, to, to the average Chinese person, that's their word for rapport, right? So, you know, like if I was trying to sell you something and I was a really bad salesperson, I might sit there for 45 minutes trying to convince and conjole you. And then at the end, I'd say, so do you want to move forward? And you would say, yes, no, or everyone's favorite. Let me think about it, right? Lots of people in syndication, I'm sure are hearing that. A week from now, I might reach back out to you and say, so do you want to move forward? And if you still say you want to think about it, your chances of getting that sale, I mean, we know, they're going down and down, right? right. Well, in China, they're going to want to meet with you five or six times before they even discuss business. I mean, they're probably going to want to see you drunk over karaoke once or twice. It's just the kind of characters they are, but that's because they're talking a lot of times, not transactional 12 or 24 month deals. They're talking 50 to 100 year contracts. I mean, it's a long, long time. They want to know the person they're doing business with. It's much more important to them in the terms of contracts. So she helps them understand that. She helped them understand the difference between e-commerce in China and e-commerce in the, the, you know, the Western world versus the Eastern. And the third, she helped them understand the importance of respect. Like learning the language isn't enough. We've got to reduce our accent. I mean, they don't expect us to sound like them, but they do expect us to try, right? That's the respectful thing to do. It's like in China, if you hand somebody a business card, I mean, in the Western world, we throw it in our pocket. We continue the conversation. We go home. We're like, who was this guy again? 
In China, you've got to hold it, you've got to cherish the card, look at all the detail, flip it over, look at the detail on the back, bow slightly, and then put it in the card case. I mean, I spoke at the 150 uh, Vice President Summit for Electrolux in Thailand, and the amount of care that each one of these people that commanded like a thousand staff gave my card was unbelievable. Imagine if I didn't do the same. And I said, when are you doing so much more for these people than just language tuition? What are we doing? Like everybody listening is doing so much more than just syndication, right? Everyone has these unique skills, unique upbringings, unique past experiences that perfectly qualify them to help a demographic of clients. For Wendy, it was these executives being relocated across to China. But then they overlook those skills and they focus on the one thing they've just learned or spent a long time focusing on, not the thing that came most natural. She said, what do you mean? I mean, they're just a few things. I mean, I'm just trying to help. And I said, you're stuck in your functional skill. Is it fair to assume as a result of the assistance that you're giving these people, you can be more, these people are going to be more successful in China. And she's like, yeah, no, I, I mean, I, I hope so. I mean, that's the, that's the point, right? I said, great. So why not, instead of focusing on Mandarin education, instead of focusing on, you know, that as a commodity, why don't we call you the China success coach? Why don't we create, in, instead of this Mandarin education, create this China success intensive, which turned out to be a five-week program that worked with the executive, the spouse, and any children being relocated across to China. We then, she, she loved the idea, but she's like, well, who do I sell it to? I said, well, who do you think your ideal client is? She said, well, obviously it's the executive. And I said, well, yeah, I mean, I was terrified moving from Australia to the United States. You know, I mean, but, and people there speak the same, here speak the same language, but it's not your ideal client. She said, well, obviously the organization would pay. And I said, yeah, I mean, an organization absolutely has a lot of money riding on it, sometimes millions of dollars, but it's not your ideal client. Frustrated, she looks at me, she's like, well, who then? I said, you're right, your client's the immigration attorney. She's like, what? So you think about it. You've got to get a visa. It's an interesting world, right? They get paid five to $7,000 to do one. But after the, the paperwork, the bureaucracy, the cost of getting a client, which we all know isn't free and is, takes a lot of time, they'd be lucky to make about $3,000 in profit. I said, so just offer them $3,000 for a successful introduction. They love the idea. They're like, well, you know, double my profit for a simple introduction. What have I got to say? All they're going to say is, congratulations, you've now got your visa. I just want to double check. You're as ready as possible to be relocated across to China. And they'll be like, yeah, yeah, I think we're set. We've got a place sorted. We learned the language. Kids are getting pretty good at it too. We've got our visa now. Thank you. I think we're good. And they just say, there's a lot more to it than that. I think you need to speak to the China success coach. I mean, Wendy would get on the phone to the easiest sale in the world. These people were terrified to go. Their organization was motivated to pay. They were introduced by their immigration attorney. I mean, she charged $30,000 for this program. After the cost of the sale for the introduction, she made $27,000 for the easiest sale in the world instead of struggling every day to charge $50 to $80 an hour. That's the power of a strong unified message and knowing your niche, right? You've got to be, everybody here listening today has got to ask themselves, what are the things that they do outside the scope of their functional skill? And then what's the higher level benefit of that? For Wendy, it was Galaxy e-commerce and respect. The higher level benefit was China's success. For me, for instance, I mean, I'm a business coach, I'm a branding expert, I'm a social media strategist. You know, I, my book was listed as the number two book ever written for introverts. I mean, I'm too many things. It's, it's complicated and in truth, nobody cares. Just like no one cares about most of the jargon that most of the syndication experts are talking about. But when I say I'm the rapid growth guy and I work exclusively with service providers to help them obtain rapid growth in their business, the simplicity of that message gets me heard in a crowded marketplace. So everyone listening has got to think about what theirs is. And, you know, having worked with people in everything from finance to life insurance to syndication, everybody is so focused on the numbers, so focused on the functional elements that they forget why they got into it in the past. I mean, there's some really smart people. They got into it for a reason, the passions, the purpose, the drivers, the unique skill sets, the upbringing, and their general, their favorite customers and the ones that love them the most gravitate them to them for the things that they're overlooking too. So this is a really valuable exercise. I know you mentioned like we have to find out what we do outside of our functional skill. You know, I, and I guess, you know, help us, you know, help me think through that a little bit. Yeah, sure. I mean, so for Wendy, for instance, the biggest focus was that she focused on the functional skill of Mandarin education. Right. But the advice she was giving on the side around, oh, when you go to China, you know, don't forget this tactic with a business card or understand the difference in the, 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 the e-commerce systems or understand that you can't try and sell in the first meeting. And she gave this great example about Dell and how they killed, like after three meetings, the, the executive was frustrated 
And they were like, can't we just talk about business? They listened through the, the sales pitch and then they were never invited back. So she helped them understand how costly jumping the gun before building rapport would be. I mean, for a lot of the syndication experts out there, I mean, a lot of times it's about, I mean, for instance, understanding money, right? And leverage and, you know, understanding those elements is one of the things that a lot of syndication people do on the side that, you know, it's not just about the deals, how to find the right deals a lot of times is, is, is a really amazing thing. But also a lot of times I find that a lot of syndication experts really, uh, one of the things they're really good at is helping unfreeze people to new opportunities, right? Because we always do what we've always done. And a lot of times we go to investment sessions, we're trying to educate ourselves, right? Like in university, a lot of times we study really hard to get the high paying job because that's what people told us we were supposed to do. But then we're now in this job and we can't find a way out. And we're going to all these investment strategies because we don't know, like it was really easy for us. We went primary school, high school, college, into a job and it was all kind of mapped out for us based on our grades potentially. But then now we've got to try and figure out in the big bad world between the, the wolves and the predators and the people that are really having something to value, like give us value, how to navigate that and find the right thing for us. And no one's equipped us with how to do that, right? So a lot of times understanding the specific demographics, you know, it might've been a parent that you grew up with that was a doctor or a lawyer. It might have been somebody that used to make all their money as a small business and then, you know, died and left the kids with nothing because they didn't have insurance products and they didn't have like a property portfolio. There's a whole bunch of things that you can bring in that's much more than just, I'm, a great, I'm, I'm great at syndication, right? And because of that, you've got to, that, that's what most people are getting wrong. They think it's because they know how to find good deals or they know how to leverage money. And or, or they, they know how to bring a bunch of people together on a deal or they know how to sniff them out and then invest really well. And you know, it's, it's actually generally not because of that. It's because of the things that you have in your life experience, the past customers that you've worked with, the specific industries. Those are the things that, that, that you bring. But you know what? One of the things that might, people might find really helpful is I actually have a five-step template that really helps you work, work through this. And the, the, you know, I did this at the National Freelance Conference gosh, it was a couple of years ago now. And this is actually a really sad story. At the, end, at the end of the session, I said, you know, put your hand up if you now have a unified message that you believe that will excite and inspire people to want to know more, but also you've identified a niche of willing to buy clients that you know will just pay you what you're worth, right? So you're not selling to everyone, which is one of the other major steps. Like 97% of the room put their hands up, which sounds great until I say it was a 45 minute session, right? I said, keep your hand up if this is the most time you've ever spent on marketing since you started your business. Like 85% of the room kept their hands up. So this template, I mean, you can access it at matthewpollard.com forward slash growth, and it'll take you through the five steps to work out your unified message and discover your niche. But the trick is, this works phenomenally. I mean, I had a florist that doubled her business in 60 days by just applying this template. I mean, if a florist can do it, you can do it. But the trick is, find somebody to work with, find a partner, block out two hours in your schedule, and actually do this, but find a partner that's not in the syndication industry because a person in the syndication industry won't call you on the jargon, right? So find someone that's completely out of your industry that doesn't get it, get them to listen to this podcast episode and so they understand what it's about and say, you're in business, you could value, you could benefit from a unified message in a niche. I could and I needed to find someone from outside the industry to do this with. Can we partner and block out two hours to do it? If you do that, right? You'll create a massive effect in your business. And it's, I mean, it's really not hard. This group did it in 45 minutes. I suggest do it in two hours because you, you're working with a partner, you're doing it with two people. And that alone will transform the way you look at your business and the way you attract clients. Wow. Matt, that's, you're, you're a great salesman, no doubt about it. I appreciate that. And, and you've given us some actionable tips here. I love that at the end too. There's actually some things we can, we can move forward with. And unfortunately, we are, we're out of time. But just a couple of questions. You know, I'd love to ask, you know, the one thing you consider that, that's helped you uh, to be the successful. Yeah, one I, thing that's contributed to it. So I, I kind of have this belief that there's a system for everything. And I think that's really, because the world, I mean, a lot of people, the world works for them. And then, so they get stuck in it. The world never really worked for me, right? I've struggled since I was a kid. So because of that, I found my own systems for succeeding, my own systems for surviving. That's always been my main focus. But I think there are two main guiding principles. There's always a system to find um, my way to succeed in anything. 
And the other is that, you know, you can decide, it's a quote, but it's, you can decide every minute of every day who you are and what you believe in. You get a second chance every second. Now that doesn't mean you change your religion every second, but it means that you can redefine when you say a lot of people, I mean, I talked about the power of story and people, it diffuses people's logical mind and you speak directly to your emotional mind. A lot of people tell themselves these stories about why they can't sell, why they can't succeed in business. And those stories are speaking directly to your emotional mind, which completely short circuits the logical mind that might have new information to tell you that that's not true. So you've got to be careful about the stories you're telling yourself as well. And that's why I love this quote, because every day I wake up and it's a new day. And every time something you know, I'm going in the wrong direction, I discover something that I'm not happy with. I make the decision. What am I going to change in my life? Not later, not next week, but now to reposition my life in a way that's going to give me the right direction. Wow. Well, thank you so much, Matt. That's amazing. And, and tell, the, tell the listeners how you like to give back. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, I used to give back in a number of different ways. One of the things that I, I used to love doing is driving out to like a remote town, like 45 minutes out that had like a coaching program going in. And I used to actually work with someone completely for free. I, didn't, I never talked about who I was or what I did. I just go in and, and give advice. And occasionally I'd have somebody, you know, say, can I work with you? And I'd say, now's not actually the time for that. Right. I mean, you're welcome to reach out with me later if you want to, but this is my give back. But what I found is I started to give back in a whole bunch of different ways but there was no system or greater structure to creating momentum behind it, which is, I mean, you talked about small business festival a long time, a while ago back that event, you know, we put over 300, we do over 300 events across the country every year. They're all a hundred percent for free. We've won multiple government proclamations of, 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 of thanks from different levels of government for our work doing that. And you know, the whole idea, we put it in lots of different cities. We work with a partner in that local city to, that runs the event and then they then we, we then create all these free events with all these free speakers and we, we pick up a sponsorship from big corporations to allow us to do that to help small businesses get out of their functional skill. So now I dedicate all my time that I, I have a specific amount of hours every week that I dedicate to making sure that that continues to grow and help more small businesses because that, that's really what I'm passionate about. Wow. Thank you so much, Matt. You've been an amazing guest. And I know people are going to look up your book, The Introvert's Edge, and, and I hope they do and go to your website as well to get that, the five points that you laid out. And also uh, tell the listeners how they can get in touch with you and learn more about you other than that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you can type Matthew Pollard into Google and, you know, I'll come up everywhere, but there are so many, I mean, I learned why watching YouTube videos. So I put a ton of content on, on, on YouTube. So you can subscribe to that. You know, I do, a, I put a ton of content on LinkedIn, on Facebook and on Twitter. Uh, but I would suggest, I mean, the two things that I would suggest you do is go to matthewpollard.com forward slash growth to download that five step template. And then the other thing is go to the introverts edge.com to download the first chapter of the introverts edge. I mean, my, my publisher hates me when I say this, but you don't need to buy my book to learn how to sell. I'm so focused on helping introverts realize that they can also sell uh, that, you know, I literally put in the full seven step process of how to sell in the first chapter. So if you do nothing more than download that, look at the seven steps of the sale, look at what you're currently saying and put that in. You will realize there's some things that don't fit, throw that out. You shouldn't be saying it to customers. And then you'll realize there's some gaping holes generally around asking the right questions, not, not questions, the right questions and telling great stories. And if you fill those gaps, I mean, I said, you'll double your sales in the next 60 days. If you focus on the message in the niche, but if you also focus on that, you'll guarantee, I mean, you'll easily double your sales in the next 60 days by giving yourself a great sales process. Thank you for listening to the Real Estate Syndication Show, brought to you by LifeBridge Capital. LifeBridge Capital works with investors nationwide to invest in real estate, while also donating 50% of its profits to assist parents who are committing to adoption. LifeBridge Capital, making a difference, one investor and one child at a time. Connect online at www.lifebridgecapital.com for free material and videos to further your success.